Hi, everyone. Uh, and welcome. I'm super delighted to see so many people out for this uh, Canadian Association of Law Teachers summer session that's entitled Experts Chat About Chat GPT. Um, I'm Sonia Lawrence. I'm CALT's current president and a faculty member here at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. And I know that other members of our executive are here in the crowd, including Sarah Jane Nussbaum and um, I think Graham Reynolds, I see others. So welcome to everyone and thanks for coming out. We are taping this session. We will make it accessible um, in a format where it can be auto translated um, and captioned. Um, so that may take us a few days, but if you have colleagues who you think would uh, be interested or if you're not able to watch the whole session, uh, probably by the end of this week, it will be available. Okay, so despite the uh, nowhereness of this digital format, we've actually lost one of our uh, speakers, so we're just trying to get that person back. Despite that kind of nowhereness, I'm just going to welcome you. I'm located in Toronto. I'm on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat, uh, where York University is located. The current treaty holders um, in this space are the Mississaugas of the Credit and as you probably know, Toronto is also home to significant numbers of Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Um, thinking about being located in a specific place with a very specific history, and in my case, being an uninvited settler on these lands, does help me to think a little bit differently about issues which, which can seem really overwhelming at first, um, but can help me think differently about responsibilities and obligations as I go about my daily life. Uh, here's Valerio. Uh, and we will, you know, I think that's part of thinking about uh, how new technologies affect us and affect the way that we go about our daily lives, um, whether that includes teaching or any other sorts of activities. So today we are going to focus on responsibilities and obligations that come from um, being teachers. Uh, for law professors like us and many people in higher education, I think ChatGPT and its, its friends, its buddies, the other artificial intelligence systems and particularly natural language processors bring with them some really significant concerns. And these concerns are both about efficacy and about ethics. So I'm calling questions about what ChatGPT can do and cannot do, how well it does those things. I'm calling those questions of efficacy. But this category also includes asking, when does ChatGPT help with learning? And when does it actually harm learning or eliminate in some problematic way the need to learn? Um, you know, these kinds of questions might be similar to the questions that we once asked about calculators uh, or graphing calculators, right? It's not just that the calculator can calculate and what it can calculate. It's about what it means that a calculator can do those things, what skills get lost, um, and what does that change? And it's also about what kinds of things a calculator cannot do. Um, to ensure that we see those gaps and spaces, uh, even while we're getting excited about some new possibilities. Um, the ethical questions are not really separate from questions of efficacy, but for the sake of lists and alliterations, let me just introduce the separation between those two things. And under ethics, I think we're just introducing a huge range of questions. Uh, is using a machine like this cheating? Is it somehow wrong? And why? And when and why should learners be, be prevented from using these machines? And when and how can professionals use these machines in the course of their work ethically? Um, what ethical obligations should be placed on the makers of these machines and how can they be held to those obligations? How can we decide when the energy use and environmental harm uh, caused by these machines are justified by the task that it's undertaking? And is it appropriate to use machines to replace human workers? The questions that are squarely raised um, by AI uh, or widely available AI are huge. They're big enough to include apparently the possibility of human extinction, at least according to some of the big names in the business. But for us as law teachers, the main question right now that we tried to put together this session for is really just about one thing. And that is what am I going to put in my syllabus? Right, so um, because it seems obvious that ChatGPT has changed the game for law teachers in two quite big ways. First, it's probably going to change the content of what you teach and um, that whether you teach about 
chat GPT or you teach with chat GPT, it's going to change in some way, maybe big, maybe small, how you teach your students to do law. And secondly, it's probably going to change um, how we evaluate. So um, what forms of evaluation are you going to uh, use if chat GPT can master multiple choice quizzes and can write plausible personal reflections. So in order to situate ourselves in this new world and to help us with the big syllabus question, which is obviously much more important than human extinction, um, we've assembled a panel of experts from across Canada to talk to us about chat GPT. So we're gr I'm super grateful to all of them for agreeing to do this. I'm sure this is a bit like um, you know, being a dentist at a cocktail party, everyone's constantly opening their mouth and saying, can you tell me if this tooth is? Um, so I'm very grateful to them. Our plan is to move through a series of questions and then with some time for audience uh, questions from the chat at the end. So if you have a question, please just drop it in the chat for us. And my colleague, Sarah, will try to take a look there. Um, we'll monitor for those. We've also already circulated the biographies of our speakers. We'll do it again in our um, uh, in the chat so that you can have a look um, because they'll get just the briefest of intros from me when they first speak. Um, and without further ado, maybe let us get to our questions. Okay. So the first question that we're going to uh, ask is really about how well do we think that the capabilities and incapabilities of ChatGPT are understood by, their, by our students or by us as their teachers or maybe both. And I'm going to introduce to you um, Professor Katie Selegi, who is currently at the University of Manitoba and who um, very presciently uh, was writing her is writing her dissertation on uh, large language learning. Thanks very much, Sonia. Yeah, I finished my, my PhD last October, and it was very interesting when when in November ChatGPT came along and all the stuff on GPT-3 in my dissertation was suddenly outdated, but also everybody was suddenly excited about AI and the law after I spent all these years on this magnificent obsession of mine, as you called it. I like that. All right. So when we talk about misunderstandings, I thought we could have three M's that would go along with it. So I have them as moral panic, mimicking form but not content, and misinformation and hallucination. So first, when we talk about any kind of new technology, right, we often see this sense of moral panic. Um, the idea that, oh, it's gonna change the world, we're all gonna fall off a cliff, everything, and that's the tenor of the conversation. And it gets a lot of clicks and it gets a lot of attention. And um, if we really want to dive into these issues, um, Ian Kerr wrote a great paper in 2004 called Bots, Babes, and the Californication of Commerce, that it talks about this in the context of e-commerce, but it's still talking about chatbots and how we have this illusion of moral thinking and participation when we're engaging with a, with a quasi-smart bot or some kind of learning or language model. And uh, that paper is from 2004. I mean, talk about eerily prescient when you read it and he's talking to this this chatbot Nicole which um, really pre previews some of the issues that we're thinking about now with chat GPT so we need to keep that moral panic in the back of our mind and then when we see the functionality and we see how it's being deployed we really need to remember that what generative AI systems are able to do so when we say GPT-3, right, it's a generative pre-trained transformer. And the generative piece of that is that idea that it's able to, you know, take from the collective, from the world of words that's out there on the internet and produce something new. It's able to produce something from that wealth of human knowledge, like the collectiveness is speaking but it doesn't do the best job, right? So it is trained on online repositories, things like the book's corpus data set, things like Wikipedia. Uh, there are some large language models that are trained on Reddit or other forms of social media that are mimicking the form again, but not the content. And so when we think about where generative models are getting their knowledge, I mean, we'll get into this, I think a little later in the conversation about ethics, but there's a lot of 
concerns about bias, about discrimination, about what sort of things are entrenched into that data set and what exactly the AI is going to be replicating, right? What exactly it's going to, to show and what it's going to look like going forward. There's a, a lot of conversations about these, these sorts of systems being stochastic parrots, right? Where they are able to sort of mimic what's been out there, um, but without being able to say something specific. And then in terms of misinformation or hallucination, right? There, it, because it is a generative model, um, chat GPT and, you know, BARD and, uh, GPT-4 is, is getting a little bit better, right? When we talk about chat GPT, we, we need to remember that it's the 3.5 series. So it was sort of an intermediary uh, level of this technology from OpenAI. And it is capable of creating content that looks like it should be right. So we already have some apocryphal stories with this. There's a lawyer who cites made up cases that were... Uh, generated by ChatGPT, but he thought it was a search engine, right? He thought he was using Westlaw or Quicklaw. Um, there's the professor who failed his whole class because he actually inputted their essays into ChatGPT and then was like, oh, it looks like these were created by ChatGPT, but he didn't understand how the technology was working. Um, but when you have these large language models, they're capable of just sort of making things up out of left field. And the GPT-4 technical paper still talks about how this hallucination piece is something that needs to be addressed, needs to be fixed. But when you're in the thick of it in the moment, interacting with something that feels like intelligence, it can be hard to remember that it's not necessarily true, right? So even OpenAI's um, founder and CEO, Sam Altman, has sort of suggested in some of his public conversations about ChatGPT that, yeah, you can use this to replace Wikipedia. It's a great first place to go for research. It's a great first place to get information. So um, perhaps I'll leave it with there for my three M's and uh, and let someone else jump in. All right. So maybe I can call on uh, my colleague, John Penny, who is now based at Osgood. Well, now, like since the pandemic, but I still count these things as new. Um, <laughs> address kind of some similar questions about what, what it is we do and don't generally as non-experts understand about chat GPT. Sure. Uh, thanks, Sonia. Yeah, I guess I guess you could describe me as sort of a new-ish um, uh, faculty member at Osgood. Good to see some, you know, uh, colleagues up there at the top, um, president and former. Um, so I I agree with everything that, that Katie said so far. Um, I think that you know, one of the challenges with a technology like this is uh, it moves very fast and there's a lot of uh, sensational media coverage uh, about the capabilities, the possibilities. And I think what's important as educators, as professors, as teachers uh, is to, you know, be concrete about the capabilities of these technologies and understanding, you know, what does a tool like this, what is it good at? Uh, and what is it not so good at, right? And let me supplement a little bit about the technology itself. So ChatGPT is a large language model. Um, and a language model, essentially what that is, it's a statistical model that produces probability estimates. That is with ChatGPT, it's not actually speaking, it's not thinking. Um, it predicts what the next word will be in a sequence of words, right? And it trains on a massive data set as uh, Katie mentioned, and it's a large range of sources, right? So websites, books, news articles, journals, uh, all that such. And it also trains using uh, a subset of AI uh, and that is natural language processing. So it's basically human computer interaction uh, and sort of the way humans and computers will interact using language, right? So Based on that reality about the technology itself, the things that ChatGPT tend to be good at uh, is really good at combining information. It's quite good at synthesizing information, especially attend being attentive to form and style, for example. Um, and it's really good at 
summarizing and telling you things about things well represented in the training data. And as Katie mentioned early in her comments, there's obviously going to be limitations within the training data set, right? So things that are well represented in the data that the model trains on, it's going to be very good at, but other things that it's less representative, um, it's going to be quite bad at. So it's good at summarizing, organizing, and composition. But the things that it's very mediocre at um, involves, you know, some critical legal skills, right, that we as uh, teachers are concerned with in evaluating our students. So it's not going to be very good at identifying um, key issues, for example, in case. Um, it's going to have a pretty superficial approach to legal reasoning beyond simply applying um, rule statements uh, to facts. Um, and as many of you have, have likely experienced, it's it's not good at sticking to course material, um, and it's not very good at sort of um, uh, doing what lawyers are often good at doing, right? Is that providing sort of a hedging um, answer, right, one way or the other. So, um, and the last thing that that Katie mentioned is that because what the system is doing is that it's simply predicting what a good answer. If you ask it a question, it predicts what a good answer will be. Uh, it tends to hallucinate and make things up, right? That it will know that maybe in this particular area of scholarship, this person, this figure is a leading authority. Um, but as many of you have likely experienced, it will make up um, sources uh, along the way. And I expect that as the technology advances, we go from ChatGPT 3 to 4, that you know, some of this hallucination will be minimized. But the training data set, um, although that will expand um, that's not going to advance as quickly. So there's always going to be some of these limitations um, baked into the model itself. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, great. And um, Wolfgang, did you want to weigh in on this one? Uh, professor Wolfgang Ashner, Alshner, pardon me, is a professor at the University of Ottawa. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'll speak in English, but if there are questions later in French, I won't... So I agree with John that it's important to highlight the benefits and some of the risks and some of the things it does good and some of the things it does not, not as well. But as John hinted at, at the end, and I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic about it, I think that the progression of technology is going to make uh, GDP style applications much better over time. So that some of these, these things that doesn't do very well at this point, they may not be big concerns in even six months or, or a couple of years. So what I'm trying to, to do whenever I think about this technology is think about the bigger picture. And for me, the bigger picture is that this technology is taking ideas and turning them into products without a uh, any, any significant efforts. So this idea of, of implementation being automated is something that I think is at the core of this technology. And if we think about that, if implementation is, is what is being automated, then that makes me a little bit worried uh, uh, about us as, as law teachers, because what, what is it that we teach our students to do? It is really about implementation. We give them prompts in the form of exam questions, or, or uh, class assignments, write a contract about this, write an essay about that, apply this legal test to, to these factors. And those are the things that are going to be automated to some extent as the technology gets better. Same thing when it comes to legal practice, associates, what are they doing in the first couple of years? They are drafting contracts, they're following the prompts or the instructions by their, by their partners. And so I think as we, we contemplate the longer term implications of this technology, I think we have to think about how we can train our law students as partners rather than associates. And that for me means that we have to spend more time thinking about the, the first part of the pipeline, the idea generation. So how can we get our students to think more about, all right, what, how do we frame this problem? What, what are the types of questions we should be asking? then following out some of the implement, implementation to the technology, and then coming back at the end in order to validate the output, in order to refine the output, and spend a little bit less time writing and maybe more time editing. So I think uh, the technology has a lot to offer. It's only going to get better over time. So let's think about where are the key strengths for us as lawyers longer term, and I think they are in the idea generation and in the validation part, not in the implementation part. I'll stop here. 
Okay, thank you so much. So we're going to move on to a slightly different question that's focused around teaching. So this question is, how would you recommend helping students to understand the potential or pitfalls of this particular technology early in their development of, as lawyers? So I'm going to turn first to Alexandra Moros from uh, Lincoln Alexander Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, to give us an idea about how we can help our students understand the potential and pitfalls here. Sure, thank you so much, Annette. Thanks um, for the invitation. It's so wonderful to be here and talk about this um, with so many people who turn their minds to it so often and deeply. Um, so when I think about helping students, I like to, kind of, what I find helpful is to start with myself and interrogate my own views towards this tool and any tool like ChatGPT. So for me, that was initial resistance and why I was resistant and trying to sort that out for myself. And then also what it was like to use it um, when I did you know, get on ChatGPT and play around with it for the first time. And I think that's helpful because it's a tool and it's a tool that's certainly different than other technologies. And I really defer to my colleagues here on the ways that that's true and um, it will change quickly. But I think like all tools, it's for us to teach ourselves um, and our students or something that I'm hoping to do for my students of, to think about how they're going to use it um, and how to make that decision critically to the extent that they're able to and can still make a decision about how they interact with that technology. And so I think teaching students how to think critically about all technology and all tools is, is my starting point for that. Um, and I like to rely on the critical theorists who have done so much great work on this. Um, you know, Ruha Benjamin um, and Neil Postman are favorites of mine and really just trying to, you know, pass on to students that, like all tools, there are benefits and there are drawbacks. There's philosophies embedded, embedded in it. Um, there are, you know, are ways that it's going to change the environment around them ecologically and not additively. And um, that like all tools, for the most part, up until now, humans have been able to control them and, and make decisions about them. Um, so that's my starting point for students, I would say. And then to, in moments when I get intimidated by the technology, you know, and hearing Katie and, and John explain like what the tech is and how it works and part of me just kind of flares up in a block. I have to remember, you know, that I use technology and teaching, you know, I'm still new to it um, all the time. And kind of what I was advised by mentors when I started was to think of PowerPoint slides. Am I going to use them? When am I going to use them? How am I going to use them in a way that doesn't undermine my teaching? What am I trying to teach when I use them? How will I release them? What colors will I use? And all those questions that I use for every set of tools that I bring into the classroom, um, I'm going to try to help students be able to do for this technology as well. Thank you so much, Alex. I like the idea of PowerPoint um, as just the analog here. Okay, so uh, finally, I'm gonna turn to uh, Valerio Di Stefano, a professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, and thanks for organizing all this. Uh, yes, I completely agree with everything that has been uh, said so far. Um, ChatGPT can be a tool, uh, can be a tool to do certain things, but it's also very important that we teach students that there are many shortcomings in ChatGPT, uh, shortcomings that I've already mentioned. ChatGPT was not conceived to provide legal advice. And any neural, any um, AI system that is based on machine learning and neural network is very narrow in the task that they, they can produce. So if something was not conceived for a certain task, then it is not possible to use that system to do that task. So ChatGPT is a language model. It can be used to polish a draft. It can be used to, and and I use it. I mean, I'm a not I'm not a native speaker, as it's uh, clear, and and it's very um, it's very useful for me because uh, it copy edits my drafts. But at the same time, uh, some uh, from time to time, it hallucinates even when it copy edits my drafts. So that some, sometimes you just input something, and ChatGPT just writes something that is like, whoa, what 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 is this? Where it come from? So. One of the key things that we have to teach to our students, and I want to stress what Alex just said, is ChatGPT is a technology, is a tool that needs to be mastered and cannot be used for top for tasks that were not designed for for ChatGPT to produce. Uh, it can hallucinate. It can make up cases. Uh, 
it can pick up, and this is crucial, it can pick up biases and discriminations that exist in the training models. ChatGPT is purported to be based on the whole internet. Well, the whole internet is a place where there's a lot of biases. And those biases can be filtered through ChatGPT and can be given a sort of technical glitch so that we don't notice that, the, 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 or we is not noticing that the text that ChatGPT produces uh, only reflect certain viewpoint, and in, my, in many cases, this viewpoint can be quite flawed or outright racist, discriminatory, uh, sexist, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the first thing that we have to flag to our students, that this is a tool, it is not infallible, uh, it is not going to replace a lot of tasks. And this is the other thing that, that mm, it, it doesn't po poses for the moment any existential threat, but at the same time, we don't need to wait for existential threats to be posed to, to, to be wary of what comes out of, uh, of this technology. Um, the, the discrimination risks are very well present. And even if they don't lead to the destruction of humanity, we, we still should fight them. And uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, some of the key messages that we have to, to, to give us, our students. On top of that, there's all the other things that have been mentioned on uh, what is legal thinking, what is the critical job of a lawyer. You cannot outsource it to a machine. Those machines are not conceived to replace you and to replace your thoughts. Uh, but certainly, uh, they are not to be feared in it in themselves. At the same time, they are tools that are very fallible, and people must be wary of that. Otherwise, they get disbarred, as it probably is going to happen to the poor lawyer that relied on ChatGPT to quote cases that were unexistent. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to put a break in here just in case all of your phones are um, pinging you with text messages. And I believe that is because um, Justice Brown of the Supreme Court just retired. So if you need a moment to <laughs> assimilate that, take it. Okay, your moment's over because I'm going to move on to Audrey Freed, who's done a lot of work on teaching um, with ChatGPT, is a PhD candidate at OISE and is the director of, she's going to have to help me here, director of faculty, program, faculty and curriculum development. Faculty and curriculum development at Osgood's professional development arm. And I'm going to turn to Audrey to answer, to, to give us kind of a specific example of a shorter or longer form of evaluation that students would not be able to use chat GPT to shortcut. Given everything that we've heard already, we can see that we might have some reasons that we might want to allow students to use it maybe in some minor ways to see how it works, but what are some ways that we can design assignments that would not um, be vulnerable? Thank you, Sonia. So I, I, I just wanna say that I really liked uh, Wolfing's framing of how we need to um, help our students become partners rather than associates. And that sort of gets at a lot of my work, which is around the idea of teaching students how to do problem setting which is how do you formulate the questions that need to be answered and that are useful to be asking. Um, so I think um, that should drive our decision about whether we want to uh, have students using ChatGPT for specific assignments or not having them use ChatGPT for assignments. Um, and in particular, if we want to be teaching them to ask good questions, to um, uh, to be thinking deeply about things, we may want to ask them to do assignments, uh, some particular assignments without ChatGPT. So having said that, I don't have a silver bullet. <laughs> Nothing is foolproof. Students cannot use ChatGPT uh, in any way, but some ideas that I've had guided by the principle that we really need, I think, to move away from the idea about surveillance and cheating with our students and we should not be designing our assignments with those as the overriding uh, concerns. Uh, first of all, it may or may not be feasible with the tools that are available to people right now and it is certainly harmful to the spirit of curiosity and learning that we want to foster in our students, especially if we want them to do that higher level thinking. So instead, 
I think it's really important to lean into meaningful assessments that are engaging, relational and interactive, and if possible, creative. So some ideas that, again, it may not necessarily be impossible to use ChatGPT for, um, but um, maybe uh, one idea is to use something, to use a series of assessments that are iterative and cumulative, where each assignment builds on the previous assignment. So for example, if students are writing a paper, you may have them begin by discussion, discussing possible topics and thesis statements in small groups. Um, if they do it online, they'll create artifacts and records of their thinking process and discussion, which is useful for them to go back to and for people to come back and, and you know, if they have a thought later about what might be useful to a classmate, they can add it in. Or alternatively, you can ask students to keep research or writing journals about coming up with their topic and their thesis approach. And that's a tool that I think lots of, for example, grad students find very useful and are encouraged to do. Uh, building on that, students can create an annotated bibliography for their paper, uh, write a draft of their paper and get feedback either from peers or from the instructor. And then for the final paper, in addition to writing the final product, um, have students write a very short reflection or explanation of how they incorporated or didn't incorporate specific pieces of feedback they got during the process. Um, again, they could ask ChatGPT to do each of those steps, um, but hopefully they wouldn't and they would see the benefit of doing that work in steps as they go along. Another uh, category of assignments that are more difficult to use ChatGPT for are what, what's called grounded assignments. Um, and I, I got this idea from um, a book by James Lang published in 2013. I think it's called Cheating Lessons. And it's um, what we can learn from, <laughs> from trying to figure out why students cheat and why we don't want them to. And what he argues is that students are most motivated when they're answering a question that they care deeply about. And so one way to assign, uh, to design assignments is to make them grounded in either topics that are personally um, interesting to students or their own personal experience, or that um, move in conjunction with an experiential learning component. So the assignment is to integrate their new knowledge um, and understanding as they explore a topic that is uh, either connected to their experience or something that's of personal interest to them. And then another thing that I, I wanted to raise, and a lot of people brought this up right after ChatGPT made its grand entrance uh, and then dismissed it out of hand, but I, I don't think it should be dismissed out of hand, is um, I, I guess I'll call it oral exams, although it doesn't necessarily need to be an exam. But um, the idea that you would have one-on-one -on -one interactions and discussions with students that could be an exam um, and the, this is dismissed often for large classes because uh, instructors say there's no way I can do that with 90 students. But if the, if the meetings with students are relatively brief, the fact that you're marking them simultaneously, if you add in all the time you spend grading exams, you may find that actually it is a, a, a reasonable amount of time to be spending on something. And it allows for probing questions and exchange of ideas and interaction with students um, that can be um, a learning experience for students and also uh, help you get a sense of where they are. And you could also try um, to have an oral component to written assignment submissions. So maybe they uh, uh, submit something in writing, but they also meet with you for five minutes to talk briefly about their process or their, or their thinking around um, how they came to their conclusion. I will stop there for now. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Um, John, I think you were gonna weigh in on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Audrey's provided some really um, thoughtful um, thinking there on, on, on this. And I think, um, yeah, as, as, as Wolfgang mentioned earlier, um, you know, the technology is changing quickly. I, I am maybe a little bit uh, more, um, pessimistic, uh, or maybe I should put it skeptical about the capability of the technology, how quickly um, it will become really good at the kinds of uh, legal reasoning skills that we expect. Um, but we have to be ready um, for that possibility. 
Right. And yeah, I liked Wolfgang's framing as well, like Audrey had mentioned, the partnering with students, um, as so treating them as associates, or treating them as partners better than associates. I think it's a nice way of thinking about it. I think in the near term, the way that I've been, again, um, thinking through these kinds of issues, like people uh, you know, raises this mean, does mean that, you know, is this the end of take home exams? Does, does this mean we cannot do this or cannot do that? And I, I think certainly um, the way Audrey's suggestions have set out, we need to be thinking about bringing like the creative element into uh, assignments, whether it's take home, whether it's exam based. I think thinking uh, again about uh, more complex applications, more complex legal reasoning, uh, adding more sophistication in evaluation, focusing less on form, um, organization, style, because these are all things that um, uh, conversational AI, generative AI platforms, chat GPT and beyond are going to be very good at. Um, but I think in the near term, at the very least, and I would say in the, in the medium term as well, um, when you're constructing assignments, you know, focus again, less on exposition, less simply on, you know, uh, regurgitation of rules, but focusing on the more complex application, um, sophisticated application, reasoning through it, bringing in um, uh, a, a requirement of uh, formulating perspective, backing it up, um, and being creative about argumentation. And if you're constructing your assignments and you're constructing your exams with that in mind, um, uh, I think that's that's one way of of, of tackling the the challenge of this technology. Um, the other thing that I've I've heard raised in other forums as well. Um, keep in mind that we've we've talked a bit about the limitations, both of the technology and of the the data set. Um, and I think Valerio and and Katie have have, have nicely raised that. Um, keep in mind, of course, that the, these models are going to be training on data sets. So if you are constructing questions based on more recent events, that's another helpful um, uh, thing to think about because it's not going to be a more recent event, more recent case um, is going to be less representative in the training data set. But yeah, um, I'll leave it there and let uh, call, uh, my other colleagues jump in. I'm actually going to turn back to Audrey um, again to ask about whether or not um, she can tell us about a kind of a longer or shorter form of evaluation that's designed to teach students about chat GPT. So what about chat GPT? I don't know, but it could be anything. But how could we um, expose our students in that way? OK, so I think there's two categories um, of assignments about chat GPT. First um, is is what Alex mentioned is we have to teach our students how to think critically about all new technologies, including this one. And I think so many of us have a lot of expertise um, that can be very helpful in um, guiding our students in, in terms of different perspectives and different ways to think about these technologies. And um, I think, you know, all of us should be doing those things. Um, in, in particular, the ethical implications of using chat GPT. Um, so, you know, for example, even straightforwardly in a professional um, responsibility course, there's an obligation of tech competence. So what does that mean in terms of um, knowing how to use chat GPT? Is there any obligation to use chat GPT? What are the limits of chat GPT, obviously? using it the way that that lawyer used it um, to wholesale create a brief that cited fictional cases was not the way, um, but also at, uh, I think, a more important and higher level, what are the implications of using ChatGPT and other uh, generative AI tools right now, given all of the ethical problems, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, in addition, I think it's, absolutely inevitable that every student who finds themselves practicing law going forward is going to be asked to use ChatGPT or other similar tools, um, and they won't be able to avoid it. And um, so I, I, I think, you know, we have to give them uh, some uh, opportunity to try out ChatGPT and see what its limitations are. 
Um, so that might include having allowing students to use ChatGPT for a first draft uh, and then asking them to submit a final draft that has track changes and that's annotated to show, um, to explain why they made changes or deletions or what they added. Um, more sophisticated, um, we could, uh, well, we could uh, generate a chat GPT draft of something and ask students to work together to annotate it. Um, then we can ask them to build on that by trying to improve on the product through things like chain of thought and other types of prompt engineering. Um, and we could also do something called, uh, well, using ChatGPT like um, as a thinking companion, and that's an idea from Ethan Mollock, where we ask ChatGPT to critique an argument that we've made uh, to check for specific cognitive biases that might be in our writing. So we, we can teach them all those things. But again, I think all of that has to be within the context of assignments directly asking them to um, grapple with the implications of ChatGPT, whether those are traditional papers or presentations. You could have them writing proposals for law firm policies on the use of ChatGPT. You could have them proposing regulatory frameworks or approaches or assessing existing proposals. Um, or we can have them doing papers or presentations or other types of assignments about legal tools that are specifically um, designed for law that are based on these tools. Um, I think that's it for me for this one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just dropping a note in here that you might want to check where your own institution is at with this. I know that at um, York, ChatGPT is officially uh, designated by Senate as not available for use um, for fear of academic dishonesty uh, violations, unless the professor specifically notes that it can be used. So I think there's a lot of expectation setting that we're going to need to do with our students around this tool, um, which is so uh, widely brooded about in so many other spaces. Um, let me ask John, John, did you want to, oh, sorry, Wolfgang, did you want to talk about uh, tools or assignments that we could use to teach our students about ChatGPT? And it very much goes into uh, the same direction as Ori just, just pointed them out. So as you kind of now guessed, I'm much more, more uh, positive when it comes to the capabilities of these tools. And I'll tell you a quick story that in part convinced me of its, of its use cases. Uh, I organized a big conference a couple of weeks ago that united experts from across the world on a law reform topic. And we projected new legal provisions on the screen. And then one person said, who had dedicated a lot of time in thinking uh, around that particular issue that was being addressed, said, who is this genius who drafted this clause there? It's, it's getting everything right. And of course, it was GDP4. So uh, I, I do believe that it has a role to play. And I think I'm particularly excited about its role in simulation. So if we are thinking about, for instance, creating a, a negotiation exercise, providing some guidelines for students, who would then create their own prompts to generate some kind of, of legal draft. Could be, it could be a contract. It could be a summary. It could be a, a, another type of legal document. And then they iteratively work through this document, either by going back to their prompts, refining it, maybe producing 10 different versions of it, workshopping it, and then again, focusing on getting it, getting it right. Because that was the other big lesson from the conference. While everybody loved the first draft, Everyone had suggestions, and I think it really triggered the, the debate to have this, this language out there that was created by, by GDP. So the way that I see uh, GDP and its companion pieces being used in legal education is to turn law a little bit more like what marketing people do as they bounce uh, around ideas in a, in a collaborative environment, is to just, just generate text and then working through these texts in order to create the best product that we can possibly have. And I think one of the benefits is that law school is such a lonely experience for many law students. And in part, it is because of the way that we, we grade, we, we do assignments that are very individualistic. But I think ChatGPT and, and technologies like it actually provide an, an impetus for us to be a little bit more collaborative and to think about teams as, as working together and uh, students working together. And I think that's that's actually a very positive development in my view. Thank you. That This one is challenging me so much. I'm, I teach a lot of first year students and I'm stuck on the, how do they, how do they engage with what's better or how things could be changed before they have the basic 
bits and pieces. And I know there's a lot of controversy over what those basic bits and pieces might even be. But this this is the part of the discussion where I realize I'm going to have to think a lot more about how to get this into my class. Um, so we're going to move on now to some questions about ethics. So everybody has kind of flagged that these are really big issues. Um, so we're interested here in kind of ethical and legal concerns related to the development, design, and use of generative AI tools. Um, so thinking about how students can engage in critical assessments that they might use of, of these tools when they're using them, um, or in light of the fact that they might use them in their future careers. So let me finally uh, introduce to you the last of our experts, uh, Professor Kristen Thomason from Allard School of Law at UBC um, to start us off on this question. So we'll spend quite a bit of time here. Thanks so much, Sonia. I'm calling in from the unceded Musqueam territory where UBC sits. Um, I feel like I'm gonna be the naysayer on the panel and that's fine, so I'll gladly take off that mantle. Um, so I, you know, I, I completely agree with, you know, the, the benefits and the concerns that have been raised around efficacy and Sonia, I really like your, um, balancing of efficacy and ethics. The way I see it is sort of like individual level concerns and then social or systemic or collective level concerns. And I think, you know, technology literacy is utterly critical for law students and for people who are entering into the legal profession and folks who are already in the legal profession. Um, but then so is having a tech critical uh, capability, you know, the ability to to understand and place technology within the broader um, systemic or social impacts that it will have. And I think ChatGPT um, really highlights or emphasizes some of that uh, individual to systemic concern that we might want to bring into our teaching. At least I'm thinking about how I'm going to be bringing that into teaching in the fall. So, you know, obviously that that raises, I think, a range of different kinds of questions, like how do our individual choices around our use of ChatGPT scale up? Um, so if a lot of individuals are making those individual choices, what does that mean on a more collective level? And who's positioned to benefit and who's positioned to lose out because of that individual to systemic interaction. So it's already been mentioned, bias in the data set. Um, you know, it's sort of a, a cliched term now, but garbage in, garbage out. You know, you can imagine some of the worst of the comment sections on the internet, like are obviously gonna lead to some biased data that systems are then trained on and might replicate in some of the outputs. Um, but there's a bigger issue with that, which is that part of what makes chat GPT and these large language models possible. And some one aspect, I mean, there's some new computing techniques um, that have obviously come into play in having these large language models with such sophistication. But another feature of some of the models that we're seeing recently is the availability of these enormous data sets. And the fact that the data set is so enormous means it's also very difficult to go through that data set and quote unquote, clean it up or, you know, actually manage the kind of information that your system's being trained on and might be replicating or exacerbating. So that's actually a part of the technology. Um, and then speaking of garbage is the way in which different manufacturers or developers go about dealing with that issue. So, you know, ChatGPT doesn't watch, you know, or sorry, OpenAI doesn't watch ChatGPT spitting out sexist or racist comments. So how do they go about mitigating some of those concerns? Um, you know, we've already seen some reporting and I'm happy to put a report in the link uh, later. And there's some really thoughtful work on this that's available if you want to share it with your students. Uh, but we've already seen a fair bit of reporting into the questionable labor practices that go into how large manufacturers go about cleaning up data sets or avoiding some of these unwanted or unpalatable outputs that we might see coming from massive data sets that are hard to, to manage. So that includes underpaid labor from workers positioned in the global south. Um, so when we think about who stands to benefit and who stands to lose, there's absolutely a global north, global south divide. Um, and not to mention also that parsing out certain terms from the data set can lead to erasure. So communities that might want to engage with a term from within their community might actually lose access to the ability to use that term because it's, you know, sort of a, a, a shortcut or a, a corner cutting um, to avoid some unwanted outputs from the system. Um, 
speaking of corner cutting, we also have concerns around how the data sets have been collected for large language models, in particular ChatGPT. Um, and some of this has already been highlighted as well in earlier comments. Um, as an aside, the privacy commissioners in Canada are currently investigating ChatGPT for possible violations or OpenAI for possible violations of privacy laws in Canada. So just something folks might want to keep an eye on. Um, and uh, I think the concern, I mean, we don't have a lot of information about what the investigation is specifically looking at, but I think a big part of that concern is around the lack of consent and lack of awareness of how people's information that's up on the internet has been potentially adopted and used um, in the creation of this tool, which profits others, not those who have contributed their information and data to the system. Um, and then, you know, that of course engages really important questions also around Indigenous data sovereignty. Like we have scraping of information from the internet without awareness or consent, like that violates Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, and with more information going up on the internet, I think that those are some serious concerns that we as law professors um, with obligations under the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action need to think seriously about how do we grapple with some of those questions in, in engaging with this technology with our students. Um, there's a lot of research already calling into question the environmental toll as well of large language models and the computing power that's needed to use and operate these systems. Um, the Stochastic Parrots paper, which is, I think, I find a really accessible um, introduction to some of the major societal concerns that are raised by some of these large language models, is a really helpful um, you know, resource for students and, and for faculty, but one of their big concerns that was raised in that paper, in addition to the garbage out in garbage out problem, was the environmental impacts of large language models. And again, we come back to the question of who's going to benefit and who's going to harm, who's going to experience those environmental impacts. Um, so that's just touching on, I, you know, a handful of some of the ethical concerns and considerations. My personal view is that ChatGPT in particular is a tool that was created by and for cutting corners. It was created by cutting corners through some of these examples that I've mentioned, like just taking information from the internet without consent, um, this sort of extractive vision that if it's available, therefore it's free for me to use for my own profit. And then it's used for cutting corners in some of the ways that we've already seen emphasized in the conversation, like, um, you know, using it to write my factum without maybe going through the proper manner of legal research to make sure that that the information I have is correct. I completely agree with the comments that like this is going to change. I mean, the accuracy is going to improve, but some of these ethical concerns, along with the improvements of accuracy are, are potentially going to become deeper and more entrenched. Um, so my personal plan, I'll just say uh, one more minute. Uh, my personal plan in one of my courses, I'm very lucky, I teach a seminar on law and robotics um, and artificial intelligence. So I have a little more capacity to do this in that class is to collaborati collaboratively, sorry, work with my students to develop a class policy on how we'll use ChatGPT in the classroom. And we have that flexibility at UBC as of right now. I know that might be different institution to institution, but present some of these sort of tech critical um, considerations and try to empower students to bring their own perspective on what does that mean? Because I completely also agree that this is not simple or straightforward. It's very complex because students will be expected to have some understanding of these tools and how they work when they enter into the legal practice. And so, um, you know, trying to find a way that we as a, a collective can think about how do we want to engage tools that have these societal concerns, but also have individual impacts that need to be considered too. So I'll leave it there. I'm happy to chat more in questions. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn to Professor DiStefano now to talk about the ethics issues. Well, thank you very much. And I mean, I, I again, I, I can build on what uh, Professor Thomas uh, just said. Uh, the number of ethical issues, again, include the question of biases, the question of, on, of environmental uh, issues that arise from the use of uh, and the use training deployments of uh, language uh, lar large language models, and uh, Professor Thomason also um, mentioned shortly uh, the labor issue. Now, as a labor lawyer, I would like uh, to go a little more into that. Um, there is a component, of course of job displacement uh, that in at this at this moment is uh, it has been as as it normally happens uh, overemphasized and that conceal 
uh, some of the other important labor issues that ChatGPT raises. First of all, ChatGPT, uh, compared to other bots or models that have been introduced in the past, is um, pretty good at avoiding to hallucinate in into extremely racist or sexist uh, language. Um, a, a previous model that, uh, that Microsoft had introduced some a couple of years ago, um, it was called Tai. It was launched on Twitter, and in less than 24 hours, it started to uh, relaunch racial slur and uh, Nazi salutes. Uh, ChatGPT doesn't do that, and the reason why it doesn't is because it has been trained by workers, by human uh, beings in the global south to weed out and to basically avoid that it hallucinates in this way. This comes at the cost of these people having to deal with disturbing uh, material all the time for a very meager pay. We're talking about one cent, two cent, uh, ten cents per hour in most of the cases because the 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 the, the mess the. The, the, the platforms that are used to train these things uh, allow to outsource to the global south for uh, as low as one cent per hour. Uh, so that, that that's their component that um, is quite hidden in the global discourse about uh, ChatGPT. Um, in addition, any time that we spend time on ChatGPT, we work for OpenAI because we train it. We uh, we uh, allow it to get better. We uh, prompt new things, and that is unpaid work that society gives to OpenAI and OpenAI or other any other technology that uh, a technological company that does this kind of tools. Uh, you can think of Google Translate, DeepL, you name it. Uh, all these companies benefit for a huge amount of unpaid work. Uh, that they don't necessarily give back to society. So one of the things that um, Altman said to the U United States Congress uh, when he went to talk is a lot of jobs are going to be displaced and governments have to step up. Yes, governments probably will have to step up, but there is a huge problem of redistribution here, of a huge value that society is creating for these companies and, that, and gets... Uh, basically uh, extracted by the companies and not given back to the societies. And we are just left to uh, basically um, cope with the potential damages uh, that the stem out of it uh, by paying people uh, that are unemployed while the companies retain all the profits. And uh, finally, when it comes to the labor sides, and again, uh, this is because uh, Professor Thomason has already uh, uh, touched on so many of the other important things, I, I want to stress on that. Uh, again, I have my doubts that we will see mass displacements, uh, mass job displacements in this area. It might be that some, some professions will be, uh, will be affected more than others. But what some something that will definitely occur for many of us is that ChatGPT is going to become for managers an excuse to um, increase the productivity that is expected from workers. Managers and CEOs or employers are already saying to their workers, "We know that some of these jobs can be done." through ChatGPT, so now you have to produce 30% more of the output, 50% more of the output. And since, again, technology is never neutral, it's always a way, and it's always a way in firms where it's large managerial prerogatives exist to augment those managerial prerogatives, this increases stress increases problems of reliability because all of a sudden you are forced to use a system that you maybe not trust or maybe you shouldn't trust. And maybe you spend even more time using ChatGPT and checking that it doesn't hallucinate than you wouldn't if you weren't using it at all. So there are all these elements and especially for lawyers and for our students when they go and uh, start articling, they might be expected to use these systems uh, because their partners or senior associates don't know that the systems are not reliable in many cases. And so we also have to alert them about these risks. 
Thank you so much. So I'm just going to, I'm just noting the time, which is just after three. So what I'm going to do now is invite um, a couple more comments on ethics and also on a subsequent question we have, which is about what's the next thing coming for us, like assuming that we figure out how to integrate or rebuild or transform um, to incorporate chat GPT in some ethical way. Um, what might what is the next thing, since you are folks who spend all your time in this kind of space, what is the next thing we can anticipate in the next session we'll have to hold? So staying on the ethics, Audrey, is there anything you wanted to add to what um, Kristen and Valerio have said? Uh, yes, I will just be really brief because they both said a lot of really great things that um, I don't need to repeat. Um, just ag again, that critical assessment is what we do as law professors and where we can really help our students um, by giving them different ways in. So I really liked Professor Thomason's suggested resource, which was the white paper from the Electronic Privacy Information Center that uh, included um, as their framework, the ta taxonomy of algorithmic harms and topology of privacy harms, those kinds of taxonomies, topologies, frameworks, um, we should be introducing students to those, having them assess them, figure out which, which ones are helpful in which situations, and, um, and be asking them to assess different types of technology using those, those frameworks. And, um, and, and I also think that it's important that, that students are thinking about all of these um, issues, ethical and legal, throughout their law school um, experience, so not only in a law and technology class, although of course in a law and technology class, but also as I uh, discussed before in a professional responsibility and ethics courses, uh, in law, law practice type courses like legal research and writing, moots and clinical courses, and also in substantive law courses. So, you know, in criminal law, you know, algorithmic harms in sentencing, things like that, um, privacy law, obviously, uh, intellectual property courses, labor law, uh, as was mentioned here in torts, dealing with, um, you know, questions about how, how might torts, um, tort liability help us with um, misinformation types of harm, versus about regulation and what different types of regulatory regimes might be appropriate for new technologies. Um, and then, of course, um, courses that are specific to tech and AI. Thank you. That's super. So I'm going to invite Katie. Hi, Katie. Uh, back in now to talk a little bit about ethics and maybe has some thoughts on what's coming next down the pipe. Okay. So I think Audrey tells us that it's every every class. So we need to be we need to be ready, right? Um, when we're thinking about these new digital legal tools, there was just one thing I wanted to add to what Kristen was talking about, because a lot of these small startups and different online things are suggesting that we can now have um, legal advice that is going to be dispensed from chat GPT. And we're, we're seeing more and more of these uh, things being integrated into Microsoft Word, for example, or um, some small startups that say they can offer you a digital lawyer, a digital assistant. And what's interesting there, I mean, especially under the lens of issues of professional responsibility or ethics is that typically we see those types of communications, the ones you have with your lawyer receiving the strictest of confidentiality, right? That's gonna be coming through the guise of solicitor client privilege. But when you're simply chatting with ChatGPT or one of these other services, um, you're not gonna find that in a privacy policy, especially not yet, unless maybe the Office of the Privacy Commissioner uh, suddenly develops enforcement powers. So uh, definitely something to be worried about and be paying close attention to because it also creates that data set. It creates a data set that then they'll be able to parse and be able to use to further develop the technology going forward. Um, and when that's used to inform different sorts of developments and different sorts of things going forward, um, we need to be worried about it. A little bit earlier, Audrey also mentioned the idea of prompt engineering, which is interesting, I think, both as something for students to be critically aware of when they're using them in the classes, but also sort of where this technology is going and what it might be a thing in the future. 
So you'll find information online about how to really exploit the true functionality of ChatGPT and other generative systems by being really, really specific with the types of prompts that you give it, uh, feeding it some of the information, giving it examples, showing it you know, a whole bunch of papers that are very much like the one that you'd want to create, um, teaching it your usual tenor of conversation and asking it to emulate the way that you speak or the way that you usually write. Um, there was an interesting news report this week of one of those Instagram influencers who makes tons of money by chatting with, um, with folks on the internet who find her attractive um, that is now able to, you know, teach ChatGPT how she typically engages in conversation, you know, starting to get reminiscent of that Spike Jones movie, Her, where she's now going to be able to make huge amounts of money by outsourcing the chatting function that is typically done. And so if we think about, you know, that same type of specificity being used by students or used by lawyers that are interacting with the system, there is a lot of potential. Um, I mean, Wolfgang's not wrong. There's a lot of potential. I just think the potential is bad, not good, um, that you'll be able to develop really, really specific prompts and specific responses. Um, and so for us going into the fall and thinking about how we're going to use that in our classrooms, right, Kristen's already given some great ideas of how we can be critical and be thinking about that in the classroom. Another interesting thing to remember is that the data set um, that OpenAI uses right now only goes up till September 2021. So if you ask it anything more recent than that, it doesn't know. And it gives you a very nice disclaimer um, that this is how much its training goes up to and it is trained on models like that. At the same time, the more we engage with it and the more we use it, um, the more we teach it how to do things, how to do things better. There's a, there's a short little paper on SSRN that um, Luciano Floridi uh, in Europe posted just a couple months ago, where he's sort of thinking through some of the philosophical issues. And he asks GPT um, to tell him the name of the daughter of Laura's mother, right? What is the name of the daughter of Laura's mother? And GPT can't do it. It's like, it's confused by the syntax of the sentence, right? It says, ah, oh, I have insufficient information to answer this query. But, but if we think about it for a minute, what is the name of the daughter of Laura's mother? Well, it's it's Laura, right? And so I played around with it. I was able to replicate this. But then if I asked it more specifically, what is the name of the only daughter of Laura's mother? Well, then actually it figured it out, right? And, and probably, you know, since he first asked that, I think in February or March, and more people have asked similar types of queries, the model learns and the model becomes better able to deploy these things. So for us as law teachers, you know, setting up problems, setting up questions, we need to be thinking about sort of what are the edge cases of where the technology is able um, to be really useful? What are the things that aren't in the data set that we might be able to sort of engage in that gray area with the students right now? And then where are the places that we're going going forward? There was an interesting piece in Wired that talked about how like even the functionality of the iPhone, this tech reporter said, dramatically underestimated in terms of where it's going and what's coming next. And I think that's probably true of um, GPT and generative technologies as well. What I'm really interested in in my research sort of looking forward is what are the impacts of this kind of automation on law's efforts as a storytelling exercise or as a collective fiction. And um, that's sort of my favorite little pet interest is sort of how story law works as a storytelling function. And so when you have these large long language models that are participating in telling the stories, you know, what does that look like? Well, whose voices are these stories in? And are they the voices of these big corporations that are going to start to take on a quasi-judicial role in our society? So I'll leave it there, but uh, definitely lots of interesting questions to talk about. So now I'm going to invite um, Alex and Wolfgang and then John just to weigh in on the future, what they think is coming in the future, and then we'll turn to some questions um, from the audience. before concluding at 3.30 Eastern. Thanks, so um, yeah, you're asking what 
what panel you should hold next. And I was thinking about that since you asked it. Um, and I'll have a very long winded way of, of getting there. But I think, um, you know, there's lots of impacts of this technology. And I think Kristen named a lot of them and a lot of them are known. I think there's going to be more that are still unknown to us today. Um, and I think these are all drivers of the future that we're going to be in. And so, you know, when thinking about what's next and what I should predict, um, my experience reading future studies scholarship says, you know, it's better not to try to predict, not because it makes you vulnerable to being wrong. Not because being wrong is inherently bad. I do it all the time. It's not too bad. Um, but more because once you uh, try to predict, you're kind of implicitly saying the future is already set and your job is to like figure it out and you'll be able to. And I think that really um, is misguided in that there's so many possible futures. And I think what's important is to keep in mind that there are multiple futures and there are multiple drivers and that we sit in one of them, which is you know, the legal community broadly construed. And I'm sure we all sit in various communities that are going to drive the various futures that are, are coming our way. Um, and so to the extent that we think legal institutions and legal profession is responsive to the world around us, um, we might have different views about that. I, I can't see how it's not going to change because ChatGPT is coming up alongside various other AI technologies that are going to be entering our world. So we are going to be living in a, inevitably in a different world, you know, tomorrow, next week, five years from now, 30 years from now. Um, and yeah, how the practice of, I can't imagine how the practice of law won't change. And, you know, I'm reminded what I learned about when, um, online databases of case laws from other jurisdictions became available and the common law changed dramatically as a result. And so, you know, I have that in mind, um, and don't see how this won't be different and that it will drive some sort of change, but I don't know what that will be. Um, and I think as we sit kind of in the present with these like multiple futures unfolding in front of us. Um, the laws that get made and the rules that we make, I think, as teachers shape the way the technology is going to be used and unfold. And so I think to come back to your question and something that Katie said about stories in the law, I think to me, the thing is missing is like a story of what we want legal education to be, you know, and like, I think we need a story to be able to at least like anchor ourselves in a future that is not, for lack of a better word, terrifying. Um, and I, I think I see a lot of drivers of change and a lot of, you know, listen to the experts and they all have different ways that this can all unfold. A lot of them are quite horrifying, um, but I haven't yet seen, and if anyone knows of one, I'd love to see it, like uh, not positive and that it's rosy, but that like a future of law that we all would like to build to and the way these technologies and ChatGPT could be used in a, you know, in a version of legal education that everyone's proud of. And um, yeah, so I think, uh, a session on what that future might look like would be one that I'd be interested in. Thanks very much. So, uh, Wolfgang. I'm sorry, I cannot de deliver that uh, vision of the future, but what I know is that, what I think we, I, I know is that we have a window of opportunity here of maybe three to, to five years, where two things are happening concurrently. On the one hand, there is a really crazy improvement on the technology. I've been working in legal tech for 10 years now, and I've never seen a pace of development that's so quick. It is really unbelievable, and it is not slowing down as, as, as far as I can tell. And so we have exponential change with ever new capabilities on the one hand. That's one side, but at the same time, and that's why I'm laughing sometimes that uh, some people say lawyers are going to be replaced. We ha have the beauty of living in a self-regulated profession. That means and I criticize it normally, but in this case, I actually applaud it because we have a lot of control over where the law is going and how this is going to affect the law. I'm saying three to five years because I think there's going to be more pressure from the outside as these tools are being employed everywhere that they are also being employed in the law. But I think we have this window of opportunity where we can take a step back, think about this existing disconnect between exponential change and the change we want to see in the law and try to make it work. But we really have to get going because it's just a window of opportunity. Otherwise, technology, I think, is just going to roll over us and uh, uh, gone will be the, uh, the self-regulated legal profession. We have to take the reins. Thank you. That's really helpful. So I think I have John, and then I'm going to ask everyone on the panel if you have one sentence left that you really need to put out there before we get to questions. You can have one more sentence, and then we'll go to questions. So John. Yeah, great. I mean, I I, I thought I'd just say a few additional things about but ethics because it, it it feeds into my my thinking on sort of what's what's next, what's the this the, the, and, and whether we're getting into prognostications, probably not, but. 
you know, just to, to echo um, you know, Kristen, Valerio, Adrian, and others um, about, you know, the, the importance of the teaching students to be thinking critical about this technology. It's not just thinking about the particular capabilities of ChatGPT, but the, the broader context in which these tools and technologies are being developed. Um, that is a broader context of surveillance capitalism, information capitalism. These are tools that are not being developed for the good of humanity. Um, they're being developed for profit. Um, and we have to keep that uh, in mind. And like uh, Professor Thompson, I'm fortunate that I'm teaching uh, a class on emerging technologies, law, policy, and governance. So I get it gives me an opportunity to get a little bit more into the broader context of these technologies, to get into the politics of technology, the politics of tech. Um, and uh, just to keep in mind, again, some additional context is, you know, in March 2023, Microsoft that owns OpenAI laid off it, its ethics uh, and society team. Google has been bleeding, leading ethics uh, uh, experts since 2020, 2021. Um, and these are the leading AI companies developing these technologies. And I think if students are going to be thinking critically about what's coming next to be great lawyers in an era of ChatGPT and AI, it's to be thinking about that broader context um, as well. And uh, so I thought I'd, I might suggest a few different bodies of work for the, for the teachers out there, the profs out there. I think science and technology studies is a great body of work that, can, that you can draw on to think critically, to introduce students to critical thinking about technology and society. Um, at systemic challenges beyond the specific ones that we've already heard on this. And in particular, I would suggest um, uh, a work uh, by Julie Cohen, Between Truth and Power, uh, a work that speaks to information capitalism more broadly. And although it predates um, ChatGPT, I think there's some lessons about the law and political economy of these tools that can help students understand that broader context. Which then brings me to sort of like the, the sort of the key question here, but what's next? And again, um, in, I think what's coming next is something that we've already seen in society, and that's increasing automation. So we're talking about the automation of, you know, shortcuts here with generative AI models and how that's going to impact law teaching and the legal profession. I think the next sort of big thing that we're going to be grappling with, some we've already seen, but we're going to see more of, and that is the automation of law itself. Um, uh, and combining um, automation AI technologies with facial recognition technology, increasingly sophisticated forms on that count. And so a lot of the issues, I mean, maybe on a positive note, the issues that we've been raising and talking about to ChatGPT, the bias in the system, its environmental impact, its impact on labor and human rights, uh, both in the legal procession and beyond, and thinking critical about this, those same issues we're going to have to also raise and think about and teach students about as we see greater automation of the law as well in more sophisticated ways, interpretation, implementation, and a broader range of context, private, public law context. So I think that's what we're going to see more of in the future, but we're getting a nice foundation for it through these conversations in ChatGPT. Okay, so let me say, does anybody have a burning one sentence that they need to drop in before we finish up here and put put what the audience is thinking about on the table? No, you actually had enough time. I thought I needed to give every law professor two hours for them to effectively Can I get... say one three-word sentence? There you go. Resist tech determinism. None of this has to be sealed. I loved what Alex said that we're sitting at a point of multiple features. Sorry, I added a whole lot of words to the end of my three word sentence. <laughs> okay, anyone else? And Sarah, my colleague Sarah may also have been collecting questions. So Sarah, did you have any questions you wanted to put on the table? Thanks, Sonia. Um, yeah, I've got one here from uh, Doug Harris. Uh, the most serious academic offense is to represent someone else's work as your own. How do we incorporate the use of large language models in a scholarship, ours and that of our students, when it's impossible to know the extent to which and the specific instances in which we're relying on the work of others and presenting it as our own? A general disclaimer does not seem sufficient. 
Okay, so while you think about that one, I'm going to put another one uh, out there from Kathleen Leahy. So ethically, she says, we as law profs have an obligation to make sure students are, learn all the existing methods of engaging with learning to read, learning to reason on specific fact situations as the first layer of learning how law is done and how crucial learning the nuances, uh, how the nuances are made at the individual level. So her thinking is if chat GPT is in any way made available in that phase of teaching, usually the first term of uh, year one, it risks losing focus on those foundational tools. It may be a good idea to have upper year electives or short courses designed to teach best practices, read GPT as the versions evolve, but offering shortcuts on how to make winning legal arguments still have to be treated as the ground from which all students can learn effectively. Um, I train students in substantive first year courses on how to use all the earlier forms of electronic assist assistance, but GPTs go beyond what lawyers ethically are responsible for doing for their clients. So these are both questions about different roles that law professors engage in, so research and teaching, and I wonder if anyone wants to respond to either one of these. Can I say something on the first question? Um, I don't think you can use ChatGPT to produce scholarship. It is too shallow. I mean, if you want to put, uh, either you add your own personal thing and you write your piece and maybe you run it through ChatGPT to polish it. That's a completely different story. And, and in that case, you are contributing to the model. Um, you're not committing plagiarism. You're just copy editing your, your draft. But if you ask ChatGPT to write any paragraph for you, uh, you will see. And I mean, I invite you to pro, uh, to, to try. Uh, try and ask ChatGPT to produce a text for you. You will not be uh, at ease with what ChatGPT it produces, you will have to rewrite it um, from the scratch. It is just too shallow. It, it, it really doesn't work. So I don't see that uh, as a problem. I mean, I would like us not to think that this is going to replace us in the next year. It's not going to happen. Uh, it is still, uh, it has so many limitations uh, that that risk is really remote, if at all existing. Yeah, I think this is something that we heard a little bit uh, in faculty discussion is whether any use of chat GPT uh, edges towards uh, plagiarism or other kinds of offenses against academic integrity. Um, did anyone else want to weigh in on those two points? We have a few others that you might be interested in as well. Maybe just uh, quickly, I, I find myself disagreeing with uh, uh, Valerio most of the time, but this time, actually, I'm 100% I'm on board. I think summarization is what we should use it for, not uh, the, the generation of, of research. That's not what it's very good at. So 100% on that. Um, on foundational tools, I, I, it's actually a, a bigger question. Should we consider generative AI or other AI tools now to be part of the toolbox of foundational tools, which should be taught in first year classes? And I, I would subscribe to the view that it is just because it's going to be so prevalent. And so I, yeah, I, I don't necessarily see the distinction, but it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that we, we should use it obviously to uh, supplant other types of critical thinking, but I think I wouldn't wait until upper years in order to make use of it. Okay. Can okay, I, I'm gonna can I jump in oh, on that second yeah. question. Um, I think Alex said earlier, there's an interesting question, right? Which is what is law school? And, and that's always the question that is at the heart of this. Is it learning what the laws are or is it learning to tell a story? Is it learning to make sense of the body of case law that came before? Is it is it foundationally philosophical or is it designed to be a practice ready lawyer? And there are a lot of diverging views on what that is. And I guess that's part of everyone's academic freedom to decide that for themselves. but. Um, if you hop on SSRN and search chat GPT and search GPT three and four, you'll find a whole bunch of people who think that it can do legal scholarship. And you'll also find a whole bunch of people who think that um, it can produce, you know, an IRAC essay in the style of a first year law student. So what's the issue? What's the rule? What's the analysis? You know, a nice little thing like we've all done a hundred times before. And yeah, maybe it's not going to get an A plus but it might be able to get a C or a C plus. And so I think that's in its heart of hearts, what a lot of people are worried about is, is this gonna supplant the intellectual exploration, the 
the thing that, you know, is so exciting in a law school classroom and is so exciting, I mean, for me, when I teach first year students to watch them grow over the course of the semester in that skill set. And so I would perhaps, you know, be asking them not to be using ChatGPT, particularly in that first semester. But I also acknowledge that you might not know, right? You might not be able to um, be able to stop it and to prevent it entirely. And so I think where um, where it's going to come down uh, in the education is to try to instill that love of learning and that philosophical exploration um, right from the get go. And there's just going to have to be um, some spark, hopefully, that persists. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's not a calculator. It's not a calculator. It's it's a summary. That's what we're worried about. <laughs> because that's been a long term challenge, I think, in first year law school is trying to keep people away from summaries in part because we think there's a learning involved in how to construct that. So I think maybe some of this is like we have to, as you, uh, Alex and Katie both said, be thinking more about exactly what it is we're trying to teach students to do. Um, I'm going to just put in two more questions. Um, that came up in the chat. So one was a suggestion that we could use ChatGPT as a robot lawyer to promote discussion amongst students, for, as a robot student, sorry, to promote discussion and provoke discussion amongst students. Um, the other one is from, uh, and that was from Alberto Salazar. And from Sean Rehag, I have um, a kind of a longer comment, which I think is really interesting. So he says, human decision-making in my field, immigration law is hopelessly biased, non-transparent and harmful. And human lawyers in my field are all too frequently incompetent and abusive of their clients and key institutions, law societies and legal aid programs are indifferent to that. So large language models offer a way to process vast quantities of legal text in ways that can help us expose biases by decision-makers, abuse by human lawyers and offer opportunities to to design improved processes. So while we should be critical of many of the problems of this tech, we can do so in a context where we're equally critical of the status quo. And we want, uh, how can we help students explore both critiques simultaneously? Does anybody wanna take that one on? Can I jump in on Sean's comment? I think that's an excellent comment. And I think some of the critiques of ChatGPT, at least like the ones that I was talking about today, I think are reflections of the status quo. So to critique the, 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 to critique the systemic issues with some of these systems is to critique the status quo. And I think developing that skill as a law student and future lawyer is Fantastic. Like is what, you know, to go to the question of like, what are we doing in law school, I think has to be one of the skills that we're trying to empower students um, to really bring into their work and their practice. And so it's not to say by any means that like all large language models are flawed or wrong, but but to be able to identify the distinction between one that is built in a certain way that maybe tries to um, address or make visible the inequities of our status quo legal system and contrast that with another that actually takes advantage of the inequities of our society and our legal system in order to concentrate profit and power in the hands of the few is a really important thing that we can be doing in school. And I think that it's a fantastic comment and a really important comment um, for us to be thinking about as critical law professors who are, are trying to foster some of this thinking in our students. Okay, so I've demonstrated that I really am a law professor by struggling with the time here. Um, so we are at 3.30, so I'm going to just close this and then invite the panelists to stay for a moment. Um, but I'm incredibly grateful to all of them, um, to Audrey, to Professor Morris, to Professor Selegi, to Professor Thomason, Professor Alshner, and Professors Penny and DiStefano for coming out and having this conversation, which, as I say, they must have all the time, although you all look quite joyful having it again, so that's good. It seems like it's a good area to get into. I'm really grateful for your time and, and for thinking through kind of some of these both bigger questions and what am I going to do in my class. Um, I want to draw attention to two things. One is that Valerio tells me that the um, uh, 
Nathanson Center uh, here at Osgood is hosting an AI and large language models. Um, what, what would you call it? Maybe it's a workshop or it's a conference. It's a conference, I think, in March 2024, by which point, no doubt, almost everything will be completely different. So we'll have new things to talk about. So that's March 2024 from the Nathanson Center. I also want to just put in a plug for called the Canadian Association of Law Teachers to let you know that we put this session on. And if you're not a member and you enjoyed this, you might want to join us. We can be found at acpd-calt.org. Um, and yeah, so I'll invite everyone to stick around if they want to for a moment to get my more profuse thanks. And uh, thank everyone for showing up and sticking around. Thanks, everyone.